All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Jason Q. I'm the managing attorney at the DC Bar Pro Bono Center for our nonprofit and small business legal assistance programs. The topic today is nonprofit foundations understanding and amending articles of incorporation and bylaws. Really exciting topic, um, foundational for every nonprofit and uh, not something that we've actually done a webinar on before. So I'm really excited to um, present this material to you all, to hear the people's questions. We can have a bit of a discussion. And then I'm sure a lot of folks will be watching this as a recorded webinar in the future as they're looking to file or amend um, their articles or, or, or trying to figure out how articles and bylaws work together to set the foundations of your nonprofit organization. Um, before we start, a few housekeeping matters for those joining us live today. Um, there is a questions field in the GoToWebinar client. Um, feel free to type questions into the chat. I will keep an eye on it and time permitting, I will um, try to respond to as many questions as we can before the end of our hour today. Um, if I don't get to your question, you'll see my contact information on the last slide. Please do reach out afterwards and um, we can continue the conversation. Also in the GoToWebinar client, there's a handout uh, tab or, or button that you can press and you can download a PDF of the slides for those of us joining live today. Uh, through that, for those watching a pre-recorded webinar, um, you'll find a link to the slides on the same page that you got the video. Uh, okay, that's I think that's it for for housekeeping. Um, let's let's dive in. Um, let's okay. Let's start first. I'll introduce myself a little bit more and what we do at the DC Bar Pro Bono Center. So the DC Bar Pro Bono Center is a legal services nonprofit, and we have a nonprofit legal assistance program. A lot of what we do is training and education. So we have one-off webinars like today's event. We also have multi-session training courses on nonprofit and, and business law. Uh, we, ho we host written resources and archive training sessions on our website. I'll give you a link to that at the end of this slide. We offer legal clinics where you can meet with attorneys to address specific issues. And I also do weekly office hours where you can come and chat with me uh, for free for, for like brief questions to help navigate resources, et cetera. We match nonprofit organizations with pro bono counsel um, if you qualify for larger ongoing assistance. Um, and all of the services and resources can be accessed through our website, lawhelp.org slash DC slash NPSB, nonprofit small business um, uh, on the bottom there. So this slide is just a teaser or, or to, to get people interested. Um, please check out the other resources and services that we offer here at the Pro Bono Center. Awesome. Um, here's the outline for today's webinar. Our goal is to understand the two governance documents for all DC uh, organizations, uh, your articles of incorporation and your bylaws. Together, these documents set up the legal structure of your nonprofit and they establish basic governance and operating rules. For both docs, we're gonna ask, what does it do? What's in it? How do we adopt or file it? And how do we amend it? Okay. Um, the legal requirements for both articles and bylaws do stem from statutory law. In the case of DC nonprofits, we're gonna be looking at the DC nonprofit code. Um, if anyone is listening or on today that's from a non-DC organization, big disclaimer, um, we're gonna be talking about DC legal requirements. If you're from another jurisdiction, they might have different requirements and they'll certainly have different processes for filing and amending your documents. So I can't do a 50 state survey in one hour. So we're gonna be focusing on DC. So if you're a non-DC organization, know that a lot of the specific procedural stuff won't apply to you. This webinar might still be a interesting educational experience to kind of understand um, what we require in DC and it might be similar to what is required in other states, but formally our focus today is on DC organizations and the DC nonprofit code. We have a package of template articles and bylaws available at this link. Um, Lauren is gonna drop it into the chat if she has a moment. Um, that will give you Word document, template articles, template bylaws, and a Word document containing template article provisions that you can copy and paste if you're filing your articles using the online form. And we're definitely gonna get into what that means um, in a moment. The big focus today is actually going to be on the articles. We're going to do an in-depth section-by-section review of the articles and a sort of screen-by-screen -screen, um, overview of how to file those articles online. 
There is a much more detailed review of bylaws in another webinar. So I've dropped the link there. We're gonna talk about how articles and bylaws work together. I'm gonna give you a really high level overview of what's in your bylaws, um, but the more technical details, granular focus is gonna be on articles today. And then you can turn to the bylaws webinar after for a sort of follow-up resource um, if, if bylaws are your main focus right now. Uh, our materials are for educational informational purposes only. They do not constitute legal advice. And I, I wanna emphasize that today because we're working with a lot of template materials, sample materials. These were not created with your organization in mind. They're meant to start a conversation and to help you ask questions. All right, let's get into it. Um, in order to have a conversation about articles and bylaws, let me first set up what a nonprofit organization is and what part of the formation process you're first going to encounter these core organizing documents. Okay, so today's presentation is going to be focused on 501c3 charities. It's the most common or typical kind of nonprofit organization, especially the organizations that we serve here at the Pro Bono Center. The core characteristics or benefits of a 501c3 include that they are legally required to be mission focused and mission first. They are required to pursue their tax exempt charitable mission. There's no legal imperative to generate revenue. And so that way, you know, at the leaders, the staff, the funders, everyone knows this is a mission driven organization. Nonprofits are tax exempt, which means they're generally exempt from paying income tax, sales tax, use, prop use taxes, property taxes at the state, federal, and, and local levels. Okay, so that's a really good business benefit of being a nonprofit. A unique benefit to 501c3s are that donations to 501c3s are tax deductible for the donors if they itemize and deduct um, itemized deductions. So that creates a unique financial incentive for especially high net worth individuals or businesses to, to donate to, have to 501c3 charities. There are also a lot of good dedicated funding sources for 501c3 charities. Um, Government grants, government contracts, grants grants from foundations, grants from other charities, for-profit corporate giving. Um, so there are some unique funding opportunities for, for C3s. Um, like all corporations, nonprofits are independent legal entities, and that means that they enjoy some um, limited liability for founders and directors, officers, and key employees of the organization. Uh, at the end of the day, the liability is going to be limited to what the corporation, to what the nonprofit holds, and it won't extend into the pockets of the founders or, or operators of the organization. There's also some additional statutory protection for, for folks serving or working with nonprofits as well. And then finally, there's just something I call, you know, the 51C3 brand, because there are enhanced transparency and accountability mechanisms built into being a 51C3 donors and the general public recognize the brand and that can increase uh, trust and credibility for working with 51 c 3 So these are all the good reasons we wanna be a C3. And the flip side of this, the contract that we have with the government and, and with the IRS, for example, is to get all these benefits, we have to, we have to structure and operate our nonprofits in, in a specific way. And that is what a lot of these legal requirements in your articles and in your bylaws are coming from. It's it's the deal that we make in order to get these unique benefits of being a nonprofit organization. Um, the 501c3 process, let's kind of look at where um, articles and bylaws come in. So I, some folks here might already have created their nonprofit. This might be old news. Some people might be at the very beginning of that journey. So your very first step is to recruit incorporators, the people who are actually gonna file the articles of incorporation and init an initial board of directors. Um, Nonprofits in DC and in most other jurisdictions need at least three people on a board in order to be a functioning nonprofit. So before you even file any paperwork, you should have at least three people lined up to serve at, on the initial board. That's step one. Number two, we're gonna incorporate the nonprofit legal entity by filing your articles of incorporation. After we've incorporated, we're gonna adopt bylaws and other governance policies. Then we're gonna go to the IRS and get an EIN, and then eventually file the form 1023, which is the, the application form for 501c3 status at the federal level. And then we're gonna go back to DC and, and other local jurisdictions and get things like local tax exemptions, local charitable solicitation licenses, local business licenses, et cetera. So there's a, there's a kind of a flipping between federal and local. But I think the good thing about today's presentation is the first time you're gonna uh, encounter both articles and bylaws 
is very early in the formation process. Okay, our first section and our biggest section today is gonna to be focused on those articles. What are articles of incorporation? So as I've mentioned, nonprofit organizations are corporations. They are distinct freestanding legal entities that exist independently and perpetually um, separate from their founders, directors, officers, staff, et cetera. So even if all the people who founded the nonprofit leave or you know um, quit or die off or anything, the nonprofit still exists, okay? It's its own legal entity. That means that the nonprofit can conduct business, enter into contracts, own property, own intellectual property, all in the nonprofit's own name. It can have a bank account in its own name, et cetera. Um, and you know, on that liability piece, liability is generally limited to the nonprofit corporation and does not flow down to individuals in most cases. So articles of incorporation are the document that you file with a state or district regulatory authority to establish this legal entity. It creates, it births the um, nonprofit corporation as a distinct legal entity. You can think of articles as your nonprofit's constitution. It sets the, all the most basic um, characteristics of your organization, like your name, your mission, your legal structure, and really high level governance and operating rules. And they reflect the statutory and IRS requirements that apply to nonprofits. So this is where we start building in the compliance pieces to make sure that our nonprofit um, operates legally um, going forward. More in-depth, kind of more day-to-day -day operating rules, those are being covered by the bylaws. So then articles are not going to get too specific about you know, who your officers are, how do we have meetings, how do we have elections, all that day-to-day -day stuff, that should be in your bylaws. The big reason for this is A, they don't need to be in your articles, legally speaking, and B, you don't want to touch your articles too often. They're, they're tricky to amend. Um, they cost a little bit of money to amend. You don't want to be amending your articles every time you want to change some aspect of how your organization works. All of those kind of more day-to-day -day operational um, considerations, we want to put that stuff in the bylaws or in of other governance policies. We want our articles to be essentially as bare as possible to still you know, be sufficient to create the organization and to put out some guardrails and some infrastructure for how we're gonna function. But we don't want so many details that we need to go in there and fiddle all the time, all right? Um, <clears throat> what should article contain on a really high level? So both the DC nonprofit code and the IRS have rules which affect what need to be in your articles of incorporation. Uh, the DC nonprofit code is pretty straightforward. It requires essentially five things to be in your articles. Um, the name of your nonprofit organization, the name and contact information of your nonprofit's registered agent, and I'll get into that. Um, basically, just a statement that says that the organization is a nonprofit corporation and that it will abide by the rules of the DC nonprofit code. Uh, a yes or no to the question of whether the corporation will have members. Um, and finally, the name and street address of each incorporator of the nonprofit. The incorporators are, again, the people who file the articles of corporation. They are like the signers of the declaration of your, of your nonprofit. Um, let me define or, or dive into some, some of these five components. Okay, so first, let's talk about your nonprofit name. Here are some rules or considerations for, for nonprofit names in DC. First and foremost, whatever name you choose must be different from any other business or trade names in DC's corporate registry. The DC government simply will not register a nonprofit that has an identical name to another entity that already exists in the district. Um, you're gonna get very familiar with this website, Corp Online. This is the district's business um, and corporations registry. Um, it's also where you're gonna do a lot of your filings. So you can search Corp Online, um, search your proposed name and search variations on your name just to see if there's anyone else in that space who's already using your name. Aside from just searching within the DC corporate registry, it's also imperative that you do a broader name search, um, specifically through the Federal Trademark Office to see if people have trademarked the name that you're trying to use, because if they have, they have some legal protection and rights to use that name that supersede your ability to use that name. But you also wanna check social media platforms, you wanna just do general Google searches um, to see what other 
entities might be out there using an identical or similar name that may not have registered a trademark with the trademark office, but because they're already out there using the name, they may already have some trademark protections and you might be facing some limitations or restrictions in your ability to use the name that you wanna use, okay? So when it comes to any name, do as broad of a search as possible to see if anyone else might, might be conflicting in, in their use of the same name. Um, a DC rule is that you can't include any words or phrases that imply that your nonprofit is a DC government agency. Um, so if it, if it kind of confusingly sounds like the name of a DC agency, you can't do that. And you can't have words like trust or bank or anything in your name that could trick people or confuse people into thinking that you're a banking institution. Um, that's another specific rule. Unlike some states, DC does not require you to include incorporated or corp or LLC or, or any other corporate identifiers in your legal name. All right, so your legal name can be DC nonprofit corp, um, org, you know, like just a name. That's it. It doesn't have to be DC nonprofit org, comma, inc, you know, dot. You don't need the inc or whatever at the end of the name. Um, interestingly, you can have the same name as another DC entity, except for the addition of like corp or inc or something else to the end of your name. So if there is already DC nonprofit org, I can be DC nonprofit org, comma, inc. And that doesn't violate that first rule where you're not allowed to have an identical name. But the um, caveat there is that that org with a pre-existing name that that you're basically overlapping with has to have, has to give you written permission to to use that overlapping name. It's probably still not a good idea from a branding and from an IP standpoint. Um, I would recommend that everyone go out and make sure they have a very distinctive name, kind of at its core, uh, from other DC entities and and from other entities who uh, your organization might be confused with. Um, a question I get pretty often is, is, can I put foundation in my name? It is certainly uh, legal and fine to put foundation in your name, but I want to flag that the term foundation means a specific kind of organization in the nonprofit world, and you may or may not want people to think that your organization is a foundation in that like capital F foundation sense. We're going to get into it, but foundations are basically nonprofits that are owned and controlled by like a small group of people um, as opposed to being a public charity, which is supported and kind of accountable to a broader swath of the public. So, uh, you know, from a kind of, again, identity branding perspective, you may or may not want people to think that you're a, you're a foundation in that more traditional sense. One thing I'll, I'll touch on here is the idea of um, modifying your name in the future versus adopting a trade name. So you're going to pick your corporate name and you're going to put that in your articles. If you ever want to change that corporate name, if you ever want to change that legal name, you're going to have to amend your articles of incorporation to change the name. Another option that some people have, if they find that they are starting to use a different name or they're, they're known by a different name, is you can adopt a trade name, okay? So a trade name is sort of like a public facing doing business as DBA kind of name that you use alongside your legal name. Um, if you do want to adopt a trade name, you need to register it with the DC government on Corp Online. There's a $55 initial fee and then $55 every two years to renew that trade name. Um, on the Corp Online main page, right in the middle, you'll see a portal that'll take you to their trade name registration service. Um, so that's another option. You can essentially go through the world with two names. You can have your legal name that's on, you know, your contracts and that's in your articles and, and that you use um, for formal situations. And then you can have another sort of brand name or trade name, doing business as name that maybe people know you by in the community um, and that you register with the DC government as well. Same idea though, when it comes to trade names that I mentioned before, Beware of IP infringement issues with other people who could be using the same trade name, either as their corporate name or or as a trade name. Um, and you know, just I find that sometimes it can be kind of confusing when that when entities have a corporate name and a trade name. People start googling you and they see that you that you have two names, they get confused. So that's a business consideration to think about, but it is an option on the table for you. Okay, that's about the name. Another. Another sort of thing that people might have, let me go back, that people might have um, 
noticed uh, when we talked about the DC nonprofit code requirements for articles is that you have to list a registered agent. So let me talk about what that is. Every DC corporation must have and maintain a registered agent in the DC. The registered agent is the person and the address that is officially um, listed to receive government notices. And even in the case of a lawsuit where like a process server is supposed to come and find your nonprofit. Um, the district doesn't want kind of ghost organizations that float around that can't be sued because they don't have any footprint and no one can find them, you know? So every corporation, including nonprofit corporation in DC needs a registered agent that is listed as part of their corporate profile where um, they can get official mail and service process and, and, and other communications. Any individual or business with a physical street address in DC can serve as your registered agent. You can't have a PO box, it has to be a street address. So commonly, it's usually like the founder will put their home address or a board member will, will agree to do it. Or maybe you know someone who's like a lawyer or who has some other kind of business and they agree to help you out and let you list them as your registered agent. Um, it, it can be just about anyone. There are also commercial registered agents that you can pay a fee to, um, usually around $100, $150. That, that might be changing um, with, with inflation or whatever, but you know, around 100 bucks a year. Um, and then they will agree to be a registered agent and they will forward you any notices or, or service or whatever that you get. Um, if you do choose the commercial route, note that DLCP keeps a list of qualified commercial registered agents and you can only use a registered agent that's on that list. Okay. If you're going to use a non-commercial registered agent, just like a normal human or a business or something, um, a few considerations. Um, one is about hours. It's ideal for your registered agent to actually be at the address that you list during business hours to receive services and notices. It kind of defeats the point of having a registered agent if no one's around and if you know letters can go missing or things aren't received, right? If, so that might be a reason to use like a business address instead of a home address if that person isn't home during regular business hours. Um, reliability, you want to choose someone who's reliable, who will actually collect and forward you the, the documents that receive instead of, you know, they look at the name, they see it's not their name, they, they throw it away. You don't want that. Um, there's a privacy consideration. So then the registered agent's name and address is very prominently listed on um, your nonprofit's um, online profile. So, um, whoever you choose has to be okay with that. And I, I, I've seen people kind of bristle at the idea of their home address, for example, being um, online. It's not super, super prominent. People have to be actually looking for your nonprofit, but they can get at it eventually. Um, and then another important consideration for, for using you know, founders or board members or other people is to just be really sensitive about turnover. Make sure to go to DLCP, that's the Dis Department of Licensing and Consumer Protection. Make sure to update your registered agent information if your current registration moves or quits the organization or for any other reason becomes um, unavailable. I have so many clients who come to me who have missed important notices, et cetera, because their registered agent was the board chair from three years ago who they haven't talked to in, in a year and you know they, they've, um, they haven't received important notices. Okay, so that's a registered agent. Have someone in mind when you go to file your articles of incorporation, you're gonna have to put the name and the address of that person in the articles. Um, the, okay, so there was that question about whether we have members. Okay, so let me define what members are. Uh, let me make sure. Uh, yeah, I'm get, oh, I get a question here. I don't know if Lauren's still around, if we can. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. So we have a link to the bylaws webinar as well. Okay, great. Uh, let me keep going. Nonprofit members. So in your articles, you're going to have to answer the question of whether or not your nonprofit has quote unquote members, i.e. are you a membership organization or a non-membership organization? These are two options for you. They're extremely different, okay? In a non-membership organization, the, 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 the head of the organization is the board of directors. The unilateral decision maker is the board of directors. The board oversees the organization and approves all major corporate decisions. It's not your founder, it's not your executive director, it's not any one person, it's the board. And in a non-membership organization, the board is self-perpetuating, meaning that the sitting directors on the board elect new directors on the board to serve when other directors quit or when their terms come up um, and they need you know, fresh individuals on the board. Okay, that's a non-membership organization. 
in a membership organization, we still have a board that still does most of that stuff. But in addition, we have a class of individuals and or entities that we call members. And these members share the governance and oversight and decision-making powers with the board. So the members get a vote to approve major corporate decisions. The members get to get reports and information about how the organization is doing. And critically, it's the members as a, as a body who typically elect new individuals onto the board. It's not the board itself. So a, a membership nonprofit is kind of modeled after a for-profit corporation where you have shareholders, you know, and shareholders, they get to vote and they get to elect people. It's a similar structure in the nonprofit world with a membership board. Okay, so you can choose to be one or the other. You can choose to be a board-only non-membership organization where the board has the final word, or you can choose to be a membership organization where you have this group of other people who aren't on the board, but who also get to vote and, and also get to approve major decisions. Um, so what you'll see is that members in this sense refers to a very specific class of individuals with governance powers. It's so confusing because in the nonprofit world, we use the term members in a thousand other ways. We might call our donors members. We might call certain stakeholders members. We might we might be a membership organization like the DC Association of you know cat lovers, and we call everyone in our group a member, right? But it just because we call them members in that sense, it doesn't make them sort of capital M members in this legal sense that I'm talking about right now. My hot take here, I'm, maybe I'm biased, I don't know. It, maybe it's because I'm a lawyer and I wanna make things as simple as possible for, for my clients. It's much simpler and more efficient to run a non-membership organization. So a board only organization that doesn't have this class of people that gets to sort of interject and be involved in decision-making. And most nonprofits, are non-membership organizations. Even some organizations that look like membership organizations from, uh, uh, from a legal perspective, from a governance perspective, they are non-membership organizations. Having members does significantly increase the administrative complexity of running a nonprofit org. You have to track the membership rosters. You have to gather a quorum of members before you can ever do anything really big. You have to give them notice um, versus having a board only model where it's a much smaller more nimble, more sort of dedicated group of people leading the organization. Um, and, and again, you can empower and recognize your supporters, constituents, stakeholders, or, or other like small M members without you having to be a capital M membership organization. So I, I'm belaboring this point a little bit because one of the trickiest and most annoying matters I have to deal with are organizations who go to form they see the question on the articles, are you a membership organization? They think members, that sounds good. And they check yes, and they don't realize that they've just committed themselves to an extremely different governance and leadership experience that they weren't prepared to. And then they try to walk it back. But once you've chosen to become a membership organization, you need your members to agree and to vote to make you a non-membership non organization. And, and that can get really, really messy, okay? So this is what we're talking about when it comes, when it comes to members. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So that's what, those are some of the things that the DC nonprofit code requires, requires your articles to contain your name, your registered agent, whether you have members and, and some basic stuff. Um, the IRS requires at minimum three additional provisions. And if you want to qualify for 501c3 status, after you incorporate your nonprofit, you have to have these three additional provisions in your articles at minimum, okay? And these are an exempt purpose clause. So 501c3 orgs can only be organized to engage in charitable, educational, scientific, or religious activities. And so your articles should have a paragraph in there called a mission section or a purpose clause that states your specific charitable mission. And then we recommend also including like a catch-all after that that says your nonprofit can engage in other charitable you know, activities as needed as your mission might kind of grow and expand over time. Um, and I'm gonna show you, show you examples of these three clauses. Um, the second required provision is a limitation on non-exempt activities. So this is sort of the flip side of number one. 501c3s cannot engage in substantial activities that are not in furtherance of their exempt purpose. And there are actually some specific activities like um, political intervention, or using the nonprofit's money to, for the personal benefit 
of you know directors or officers or, or the founder or whatever um there's stuff that you can't do as a nonprofit. So the IRS suggests specific language that prohibits the organization from engaging in prohibited activities uh, to put that in your articles. And then finally, you need to have a dissolution clause. Uh, under federal law, if a 501c3 organization dissolves, its remaining assets must be transferred or used for other taxes and purposes. So generally, you would you know, either spend that money on your mission and sort of just spend it down, or you would transfer it to another nonprofit organization that's doing similar work, or you can transfer it to a government agency, um, but but you can't just dissolve and then you know give everyone a payout um, you know, at the end of the day and just let them walk away with the money for their personal use. It has to stay within the mission, okay? So DC organizations need to write that dissolution limitation into their articles. Let me just flip and see if there's any questions that we should do right now. Okay, yep, I'm gonna hold on for a few more seconds before I get to questions. So, okay, here is a sample of what that purpose clause might look like. Uh, you'll have something in there saying, the purpose for which this or corporation is organized are as follows. And then you're gonna list a specific purpose. You know, we are an association of DC cat lovers who will advocate for cat welfare and help people adopt kitties, you know, something specific like that. And then B, to, uh, you'll, you'll have a catch-all in there that say, and we can do anything else that we want consistent with 501c3's requirement for religious, charitable, scientific, or educational purposes. That catch-all just gives you a little bit of flexibility to, to expand your mission, to shift, to grow, um, although you don't wanna be doing things that are completely different from your specific mission. Um, You'll want to amend your articles if you find yourself in that situation. Okay, uh, my drafting tip for for your purpose or mission clause, you want something that's specific enough to communicate your mission to key stakeholders, including the DC government and to the IRS who are going to be looking at this language and trying to figure out whether you're a nonprofit or not. So it has to be pretty specific, but you do want it to be general enough to accommodate Again, changing activities, focus areas, or constituencies over time. You don't want to have to go back and amend your articles every time you try to pivot or expand your mission. You know, for example, if you say we are a DC nonprofit that only works in Ward Four to support this specific uh, community center or or park, um, that's a really really specific mission. And if you know you get bigger, you grow over time, and and you want to support other parks, you want to work in other areas, you want to do things that are just not supporting parks. You're gonna have to change your articles because you've boxed yourself in to a very specific mission. So there's a balance here. There's a dance between being specific enough to, to have, um, to, to communicate you know, what you're actually doing, um, but also not boxing yourself in and, and trapping yourself in a situation where you're always going to be amending your articles as you grow. Okay. Um, this is a lot of text, I'm not gonna read it all, but this is an example of a limitation on non-exempt activities clause. And what this language basically says is that we are gonna follow the law that applies to 501c3 organizations. We're, we're not going to, for example, use our assets to enrich our members, directors, officers, or other private persons. All of our money is gonna go into the mission. That could include, by the way, paying staff to you know, accomplish the mission, that's fine, but it's not going to just be like bonuses for our directors. You know, none of that. Um, number three says that we're not going to attempt to carry on propaganda or influence legislation. There's a whole um, corner of nonprofit law about what kind of advocacy, lobbying, and political intervention you're allowed to do. Um, and you know, number four says basically we're all, we're not going to break the law of the United States. Kind of kind of basic high level stuff like that. The IRS wants to see language like this in your articles okay and this is the third irs required provision for your articles um, a dissolution clause saying at the dissolution of the corporation the assets the corp of the corporation shall be distributed for um, exempt purposes okay so that's what i teased before again um, in the uh template package that lauren sent you're gonna or, or that's linked to this presentation you'll be able to copy and paste language like this Okay, let me take this as an opportunity to scan through questions um, really quickly before we move on. Let's see here. Can you change the logo of the business? Yes, um, logos are not in your articles um, and you can change them as you need to. Do we need to update the articles every time the registered agent changes? Great question. No, there is a different form that the DC government provides you just to change a registered agent. And, and I'm gonna 
show that to you in a second. What happens if the original corporators are no longer around? Doesn't matter. The, the articles are a snapshot in time and they're gonna say who the incorporators were, but the incorporators, aside from incorporating the organization, have no other job by default, okay? So it's a historical document. It's like, what if the founders of the US Constitution are no longer around? Doesn't matter, okay? Everything's fine. Um, I'm gonna talk about maybe converting your incorporators into members of your board, but that's different. That's, that's be being a board member. Just being an incorporator, you sign the articles, you file them, your job is done. That is all you do, okay? Incorporators are not super important in the, in the long-term um, health of your organization. What would the role of a deliberative body like a Senate be? Great question. Um, so some organizations, I, I told you, you could, have, you could have just the board or you could have members. Um, some organizations have other bodies. They have a Senate, they have like a governing council, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can have bodies like that without being a membership organization necessarily. So you can write in a, a deliberative body that, you know, has to like up, weigh in on major decisions, or maybe they're like an advisory body. Um, you can totally create that. And it's sort of outside the scope of today's presentation to talk about exactly how you would do that. But the big takeaway that you need to know for today is that th that does not mean that you're a membership organization, okay? You are only a membership organization if you want a group of people who elect the board and who approve major corporate decisions that are not the board itself, okay? So two very kind of narrow functions. Um, if you don't want that, you can have a board and then we can build in all these other deliberative bodies that advise, that have specific jobs, maybe they're a committee, um, but that doesn't make you a membership organization. But, uh, um, how do you check to see if you're listed as a member or non-member org? Great question. I'm going to talk in a second about how to pull a copy of your current articles off of DC's corporate registry, and that'll let you see whether you're a membership or non-membership org in there. Um, can a nonprofit offer members, in this case, donors, special perks, but doesn't want to offer other benefits? Yeah, you, you can be a small M membership organization where you have a group of people, maybe because they're donors, that then get certain benefits or they get tickets to events or whatever. That's totally fine. Again, a little bit outside the scope of today's presentation because they are not capital M governance members. Uh, but, but, but can the purpose be broader than the mission? I'm using purpose and mission interchangeably here in your articles. You just have to have one purpose slash mission clause. Don't have a mission clause and a purpose clause. I know you see a lot of um, like business plans that ask for both. In this case, just you want a purpose slash mission clause that tells the IRS and tells the DC government what you plan on doing. Okay, to, to just give them enough information to say, Yep, that sounds like a charitable, educational, religious, or scientific mission to me. I will approve this organization for 501c3 status. That is the only function of the mission and purpose clause in your articles and in your bylaws. You can have a much more elaborate mission statement, purpose statement, theory of change. Put it on your website. Put it in a policy. Um, you don't need that in your articles and bylaws. And remember, you're going to have to amend your articles if you ever want to change it and you put it in your article, articles. So leave it out is my general recommendation. Okay, um, so we talked about what the DC government requires your articles to contain, and then we talked about IRS requirements. Um, there are a lot of optional, additional provisions that you're allowed to put in your articles, that, but you don't have to. And I'm gonna recommend that you put in um, at least nine additional provisions. These are all in our template articles. I'm gonna run through them briefly because none of them are very complicated. Um, so the first is a duration clause. It just confirms that your nonprofit is a permanent organization. Way back in the day, sometimes nonprofits and other corporations would be time limited. They're like, oh, this is gonna exist for 50 years and then it's gonna go away. We don't want that. We wanna make it clear that we're, we're intending to create a permanent organization. I would recommend you have a line in there that confirms that your nonprofit will not issue stock like a for-profit corporation can. Um, that just clarifies, even though we're calling ourselves a corporation, it's not the kind that has shareholders and issues stocks. Um, there should be a line in there setting the floor for the minimum number of directors. And this is because the DC 
nonprofit code requires at least three directors. So we should write into our constitution that no matter how many directors we end up having, we will always have at least three because that's the minimum that we need to be a legal entity in the District of Columbia. Um, we're gonna have a section in there that's basically a description of general powers. It's gonna confirm that we want to be a full corporation with all of our traditional corporate powers. Okay, so you're not gonna read all this language, but it's gonna say, you know, we can do things like accept donations, we can um, have our own bank account and maintain control of our finances, we can use the funds and control the use of funds, we can enter into contracts. Um, so language like this, just so that no one's confused about whether we're some weird kind of limited corporation. No, we are a full corporation. We do all the things that normal corporations can do. Um, we recommend a paragraph in your articles that covers a situation where your 5-1 nonprofit might flip from being a public charity to a private foundation. So 5-1C3 nonprofits come in two flavors. As I mentioned, Today's presentation, I'm assuming that you all wanna be public charities. Public charities receive at least one third of their funding from the general public, from other charities, or from government sources, okay? This is the most classic kind of charity. Because you have that one third threshold of public support, um, we, we think that you're kind of more accountable and transparent to the public. And therefore, we're gonna take our hands off a little bit and give you a little bit more latitude in how you spend your money and how you how you govern your affairs. There is another kind of C3 nonprofit called a private foundation. And these are primarily funded and controlled by a very small circle of um, very wealthy individuals or companies. So maybe you know a wealthy individual will die and they'll leave a ton of money to a trust and they say, I want this money to go and set up a foundation. So that foundation is gonna be 99% funded by one person's gift. And because there's, it's so limited in the number of people funding it, and maybe everyone on the board is like a family member of that person, that kind of nonprofit, the IRS is a little more suspicious about. Um, and they are subject to more onerous transparency and financial reporting requirements. You generally do not want to be a private foundation unless you absolutely have to be because of your funding situation. So I'm assuming everyone here wants to be a public charity, but I do recommend a paragraph in your articles that say, if for some reason our funding situation changes and all of our money starts coming from one or two people, you know, instead of from the general public, we will abide by the rules that apply to private foundations. You know, basically in that situation, we're not just going to kind of dissolve and go home. We are just going to become a private foundation and then we'll start following the rules that apply to private foundations. That is the flip provision here. Okay. Um, recommend a provision limiting liability. So this confirms that your nonprofit is a limited liability entity. Um, um, all persons, entities extending credit to, contracting with, or having a, a claim against the nonprofit may only look to the funds and property of the nonprofit and cannot um, look to the funds of your incorporators, directors, officers, etc. Okay, good stuff. Everyone wants this, everyone should have this. Related to limitation of liability, your articles should have a indemnification provision. And so in DC, the nonprofit code legally requires that your nonprofit indemnify directors and officers. And what that means is that your nonprofit is going to step up and cover the costs related to lawsuits or other proceedings connected to these people's service to the nonprofit um, in a certain class of situations. And then the common practice is for nonprofits to extend that indemnification process to basically all situations where a director or officer may be sued in connection with their nonprofit service. You know, the idea here is that individuals are not going to volunteer their time to serve on your board or to serve as an officer if, you know, something bad happens and they can end up being personally liable for paying for, you know, their legal defense or, or et cetera, et cetera. So, the practice in DC statutorily and also practically is to offer indemnification to your directors and officers for their service. Practically, the way that you fund that obligation is when you can afford to, you buy a kind of insurance policy called directors and officers, DNO insurance coverage, um, and then the insurance company will step in and pay for that legal defense and, and those damages and et cetera. Okay, so bylaws will typically provide very detailed information about who qualifies for indemnification, how you approve indemnification on a case-by-case -case basis. But your articles should have a short paragraph in there, something like this. Um, 
saying that indemnification is something that your nonprofit is always going to offer. Okay. Uh, the eighth section is, is we want something about amendments. So this confirms that your nonprofit can amend its articles or make other kind of major corporate decisions. Pretty basic stuff. Um, we're going to leave the specifics of how to amend uh, for the bylaws, but we're just going to make it clear that the, the articles are amendable. Um, and finally, uh, we could, this one's the most optional one, number nine. Um, the incorporators have to sign the articles. Optionally, you can add a provision in that automatically converts the incorporators into the initial board of directors. So what this means is starting on day one, as soon as you incorporate, everyone who signs these incorporation papers, boom, they're sitting on the board. Okay, they, they just seamlessly convert from one to the other. You don't have to do this. You can have the incorporators do their job, and then basically they, they then elect the new board at your organization's first board meeting. Um, and they can elect themselves if they want, but they can also elect other people from the candidate pool. And then once they're finished with their election, then the incorporators put up their hands and they step away from the organization. And those that have then been elected on the board can then serve on the board. Um, but that could be a good option if you're incorporators, if you have incorporators who don't want to serve on the board, or if you're filing your articles and you just have like one person, you can technically file articles with just one incorporator um, and you don't have three people identified yet to, to, to serve on the board. Um, my recommendation is to have three people ready to go on the board the day that you file your articles of incorporation. It's very awkward to have that gap period where you have a nonprofit, but you don't have a board. Um, technically, your nonprofit can't do anything and it's, it's not, it, it's rudderless, it's leaderless. So I like the provision that says the incorporators, we have at least three of them and they're automatically gonna become members of the board. I think for me, that's smooth and easy and that's the way I would do it if I was forming a new nonprofit. Okay, we've gone through content, okay? Now I'm gonna show you a, a bunch of screenshots to show how you file your articles. Your articles are filed with the DC Department of Licensing and Consumer Protection. Specifically, there's a form called DNP1 and the place that, you probably should be filing this if you can is online because there's a very user-friendly online portal for filing your articles. All the DC nonprofit code requirements, your name, your registered agent, your whether or not you have members, that is automatically covered when you file the form DNP1. But you must use a miscellaneous provisions box in the form to add those IRS required provisions and any other of those nine optional-ish provisions that I've covered in this presentation. Okay, and I'll show you what that looks like. So this is the Corp Online landing page. You're gonna sign in with your Access DC account. If you don't have one of those, it you can make one for free. It just takes a few minutes. Then we're gonna get onto the Corp Online landing page. And the, the, the option on the left is to register a new organization. We're gonna click that. We're gonna say that we do not already have a registered organization. We're creating a new one, okay? And then you're gonna get a list of all the new organizations you can create we're going to click nonprofit corporation, and this is going to start the, the DMP1 process. One thing we get to do if we want is we can claim a name reservation. So if you want to reserve a name for your organization up to 120 days before you file the articles of incorporation, you can do that. So if for some reason you, you're worried about other people claiming your name as you're, as you're getting your stuff together, um, you can file a name reservation. And then this is where you then claim that name reservation for your application. Most of you will not need to do that and, and will not be doing this. Um, next, you're gonna put in your business's name and the effective date of your incorporation. You probably just wanna pick the date that you're filing. You know, So if I'm, if I'm filing on the, on the 20th, I'll pick the 20th. You can set it into the future if you want, up to 90 days. Um, one thing to think about for your effective date is that down the road, when you get your 501c3 status with the IRS, that status becomes retroactive to your effective date. So you get all the benefits of being a nonprofit all the way back to the date of incorporation. And that's really, really good because it can take a really long time for the IRS to process and approve your 501c3 application. So you're gonna have a gap period between when you incorporate and when you become a 501c3. And so it's good that there's this benefit that it becomes retroactive to your date of incorporation. Um, the clock to file your 501c3 application starts on your effective date and it goes for 27 months. Okay, that's a good amount of time, but you do want to file 
your 501c3 application within 27 months of your effective date. And that might be the only reason I can think of to push your effective date forward 90 days, because then the clock won't start. You know, that gives you another three months for the clock to start. But I, I really don't think there's a reason for that either. You probably want your effective date to be the date that you file these articles. Okay, the next thing they're going to ask on the page is for a business address. Now, at this point, a lot of nonprofits don't have an office. They don't have a site. They don't have a facility, whatever. So people ask, what do I use for the business address? Um, you can use an incorporator's home or business address or even a, a PO box. In this case, it doesn't matter too much. Um, it's going to be listed in the org's public records. So make it an address that you're comfortable being associated with the organization, at least until you find a more permanent space. Speaking of permanent space, something I want to flag for people is that by the time it gets the time to secure a business license for your nonprofit, this is after you get your 501c3 approved, and it's after you raise at least $50,000 in one year, you have to get a business license. At that point, you will need to provide DC with a commercially licensed street address, like non-PO box physical address for your nonprofit. So either you're renting commercially licensed doc, um, office space, or you get a home occupancy permit, or you're sharing space with like another business or another nonprofit. But one way or another, just down, down, down the line, you are going to need a DC street address, but you, you do not need it at this point of incorporation. Here's that members page, okay? It's it's a box. It's asking, does your does your organization has members? And this is where a lot of people check yes because they don't know what they're doing. Um, check yes if you want to be a membership organization, but leave the box blank and just hit continue if you want to be a non-membership organization. Next page, you're going to list out your incorporators. Uh, technically, only one incorporator is required, um, but you can add as many as you want. And especially if you're doing that thing I mentioned a few slides ago of automatically converting your incorporators into your initial board. You do want to list out all of your incorporators. They need a name and an address, and you'll see a box down there to the bottom to add additional incorporators. So get everyone onto the form. The next screen you'll see is to identify your registered agent. We flagged this already. If you're using a non-commercial registered agent, you're going to click yes to that question, and then you're going to give DC the name and address of the of the person or business you're using. If you're using a commercial registered agent, um, there the form automatically provides you with like a drop down list of all of the DLCP approved commercial registered agents, and you would just pick whatever company you've paid to be your registered agent. Okay, so those are your two options. Okay, this is the the, the big one, the miscellaneous provisions box. This is where you're going to copy and paste in all of the IRS required provisions and any other additional recommended provisions into this text box right here and then hit continue and that will integrate that language into your articles as well this is your only opportunity to do it um, and so it's important that you do it here in the um, template documents that we've provided you one of those documents is a word document where i've formatted out sort of template article provisions that you literally well you have to modify them a little bit but eventually you could just copy and paste into this box that's the idea of that document is, is where we know that this is the way that they're doing it now. And so we're, we're gonna give you language that you can literally copy and paste into this field here um, to cover the three IRS required provisions and then those recommended provisions that I mentioned um, earlier. Okay, there's another screen where you can then upload additional documents. Back in the day, we, would, we used to like upload our miscellaneous provisions kind of stuff into the field, but I've, sometimes that confuses the agency, especially if there are differences between what you upload and what you put in the mis miscellaneous provisions field. And now there's more specific instructions to not, for example, um, put your IRS required language into, into a separate document. So 99% of you should not be using this screen. There's nothing else to upload. Everything you want to add should be going into the miscellaneous provisions field, um, and that's it. Um, okay, and then we basically get to our final screens, which are like a confirmation screen and payment screen. Um, you have the option of selecting expedited service, 24-hour service for $100, three-day service for $50. You can do it if you want. The base filing fee is $80. Um, but one thing that I'll note is that um, I've seen a lot of applications turned around within three days, even if you don't pick the $50 expedited service. No guarantees, but that's just something I want to flag to people. Um, the, these get turned around pretty fast, definitely 
definitely usually within a week. Um, so the three-day service might not be too useful. The $100, the hundred dollar 24 hour service can be good if you're in a real rush. Okay. Um, I'll note that there is an option to file a paper DNP one by mail. There's a link to download a PDF here. And then if you do that, you just print out your miscellaneous provisions on a separate piece of paper and you mail that all in with $80 to the DC treasurer. Okay, um, one thing that I wanna note for people, um, we're probably gonna go a little over time. So I apologize for folks who have to cut off right at one um, for, the, for the live folks, but know that this is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the webinars. Um, a, a common problem in DC is that people file what I call empty articles. All they do is they click through the screens that I just showed you. They ignore the miscellaneous provisions box because they have no idea what they're talking, what, what the agency is talking about there. And then they click submit and they think they're good. Okay, but as I've already kind of belabored, there's really important language that you do need to put in that miscellaneous provisions box um, in order to qualify for 51C3 status. And the even worse part is that folks who do this might go off and file an IRS application for 501c3 status, and they still don't realize that their articles are missing critical language. Because when you file the easy version of the 1023 application to the IRS, um, they ask you to like check a box saying, um, does your organizing document limit your purposes to exempt purpose? Does your organizing document um, not allow you to do all the prohibited stuff we talked about? Does your organization document have a dissolution clause and all you do is click yes 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 um, a lot of people click yes and they, they don't actually know if that's in their document or not and the the irs doesn't look at your articles um, if you file the easy application so a lot of easy filers file these like essentially blank articles with dc and then they file their 1023 and they check yes to these boxes not sure what they're agreeing to and uh it, it causes a real problem so um Ask yourself, do you have complete articles? Did you only file form DNP1 without adding additional language to your miscellaneous provisions box um, or attaching additional documents? You know, aside from being out of compliance with IRS rules for, for nonprofits, funders or stakeholders might look at these articles and say, you don't have anything in here. All you have is your name and your registered agent and that you don't have members, you have nothing in here. And they might refuse to support you because you don't come across as a credible uh, organization that knows what it's doing. And finally, having these empty articles means that you lack some of the practical infrastructure that the articles are supposed to provide. Okay, so I want everyone to think about when they filed their articles, what was in there? Did they just use the form? Um, some of you are thinking, I have no idea. I haven't seen the articles in a long time. I don't remember what I filed. So if this is your situation, um, back on that Corp Online webpage, there is a option to um, order certified copies of your organization's articles for $40. I would, I would just go ahead and do that and see what's on file with, with the DC government. Um, you click that screen, you get the next screen, you click order certified copies, you look up your organization using this search tool. And then, so I use my organization as an example. Um, then you type in a description of what you're trying to pull um, and they recommend that you be as specific as possible. So I'll say something like the most recent articles in corporation for the DC Rep Pro Bono Center and all amendments. And then you, you, you pay $40 and, and they'll provide you with a copy. And that'll be a good starting point to assess what your articles look like today and what you might be missing. Okay, let's definitely talk about amendments. When do you need to amend your articles? Any changes to your articles, any changes must be filed with DLCP using form DNP2 articles of amendment. So with DNP1 was articles of incorporation, DNP2 is articles of amendment. Common reasons for filing an amendment might include um, you filed empty articles um, accidentally and you wanna add in all the rest of the stuff. Maybe you wanna change your nonprofit's name. Um, that's set in your article, so you have to change the articles to change that. Maybe you wanna change your purpose statement. Maybe you wanna change or eliminate your membership structure. Again, I, that's my nightmare scenario. I hate doing that, but people do it all the time. Um, do not use DNP2 to change your registered agent. Um, there's a separate form, form RA3, that you can use to update your registered agent, okay? Um, so the process is first, you either have to get board approval or if you're a membership organization, membership approval um, for the proposed amendments. And, and that's gonna be adopting what we call articles of amendment in your organization to amend the bylaws. Uh, sorry, to amend the articles. Check your articles of bylaws themselves because they might have rules that speak to how to amend your articles, but 
barring anything super unusual, if you're a non-membership organization, the board just votes on an amendment and then approves the amendment. If you're a membership organization, the proposed amendment is either generated by the board or by at least 10% of the voting members and then approved by a formal membership vote. This is one of the million situations where being a membership organization is much more annoying than being a direct uh, board only organization. If your membership organization has multiple classes of members and the amendment is gonna change the structure of your classes or the rights of certain classes, the voting is even more complicated. I'm not gonna get into it. And if you're a membership organization, there are a small number of technical amendments that the board can do on its own. Um, and this might be relevant to some people. If you're a membership organization, but the board uh, but, but has never actually issued any memberships, in that specific situation, the board can amend the articles without membership approval, without a membership vote. So for some of you who accidentally became membership organizations when you incorporated, but have never actually had members, you still have a chance to go back and change your articles and get rid of um, that membership structure if you need to, um, because you haven't actually issued memberships yet. Okay, well, however you approve it internally, you do that, then you go back onto Corp Online and you file form DMP2, um, it, again, it's an $80 filing fee. I'll click through that really quickly now to show you what it looks like. It's in other online services. You search up your organization. Um, I find this search tool a little tricky sometimes, a trick. If, you're, if your organization isn't coming up, click search options there on the top right. Um, change the search depth from exact match to contains and then try your organization's name. That will usually pull it up um, if you're getting a blank. Um, once you find your organization, Corp Online is going to show you all of the online filings that you can do for that corporation. And so here we have the option to file DMP2 articles of amendment. And if you look on the bottom, RA3, that's the registered agent change form that I mentioned. Okay, so it's the same kind of general process to file either. Um, then you're going to get another text box. They love text boxes. And you're going to type in your amendment into the text box. So the format is going to be, you're going to tell them which article you're amending. So this can be like article one is amended to read or article seven section B is amended to read. And then you copy and paste in the entire new language for that article or for that section. And then that will instruct the DC agency to replace the old language with the new language. Okay, so that's that's how you do it. And, and you can list out your amendments here in the text box. The next screen, you're gonna tell the agency how you approved these amendments. So you, there's a drop down list of five options. The main options that you're probably going to use is the first one. If you are a non membership organization, the amendment was duly approved by the incorporators or the board and shareholder approval is not required. That's going to be most of you in most situations. Um, and then there are other options. If um, you're probably not going to need two or three, um, you might need or if you're in that situation where you're a membership organization, but you never had members, and so the board just did it, that's four. And then five is uh, if you're a membership organization and you had a membership vote. Okay, so you're gonna select the, the approval situation that applies to you. The next screen, um, it's, uh, it's gonna show you all of the directors that are currently on file with the agency. And you have an option of, deleting old directors, adding new directors. I would use this as an opportunity to just update your list of both directors and executive officers. So if you have like a executive director or something, put them on here as well. Make sure your governor list is, is up to date and accurate when you go to file this form. Finally, there is another upload documents screen as part of the amendment process. And an interesting thing here is that you do appear to have the option of attaching what we call restated articles. Um, and I'm going to get into that in a second. So this is where you would update your uh, upload your restated articles. And then after the screen, it's the payment screen. It's $80, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let me talk about what restating your articles is. So when you do this amendment process that I just described via form DMP2, what happens is that you have your original articles and then there's a separate document in your file like an amendment, like a one page piece of paper that says, and then they filed an amendment that changes article seven to read this instead of that, okay? And you basically have like multiple pieces of paper floating around. Restating your articles is the process of consolidating and integrating your amendments into a new 
updated official version of your article. So it basically eliminates all the extra pieces of paper and formally integrates the amended language into your articles. That's what we mean by restating your articles. Okay, it's not meant to introduce new content. It's a cleanup function. It integrates all of your old amendments into a single document or record. Um, DLCP has a standalone paper form for sure, DMP3, that allows you to file restated articles. So you basically say, this is here is a new kind of cleaned up version of our articles with all of our amendments integrated. It's dated December 20th, 2022. Um, this is what we want to use for our articles going forward. You know, and, and that's how you do it. You, 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 you show them that you file, you include an $80 fee. I have not seen a virtual version of DNP3. So I'm a little confused about how you do it electronically, but I think what they're trying to do is allow you to do it via the DNP2 form that I just walked you through. So instead of attaching an amendment to your art or articles, um, you just use DNP2 to let the agency know that we're filing restated articles that consolidate all of our amendments into a single document and then you use this upload screen to to upload the new cleaned up sort of um uh integrated articles with all the amendments in it so i i think that should work i haven't done it before um but that's the only online avenue that i can see so i, I think folks should try it please let me know if it doesn't work um and i'm also not completely sure if you can file an amendment Right, so you're saying I want to change something in the articles, and in that exact same filing, attach restated articles that incorporate the new amendment into your articles, and say, "Oh, I also want you to start using this as the final form of my articles going forward." I'm not sure if you can do that all in one filing, or if you need to do a standalone restatement filing. That's like, okay, I gave you all these amendments before. Here is my articles with everything kind of wrapped up together in one filing. Not completely sure if if they're going to ask you to do two filings. I would encourage people to just try to do it all in one filing if, if they can, and uh, we'll see what happens. I don't know. I think it should work. Uh, this is what the paper form looks like um, for those who are wondering. So hilariously, we've gotten over in an hour, and I haven't even gotten to bylaws yet. I'll touch on them really quickly. Something um, I want to note, we're talking all about stuff with the DC government. Um, when we're changing our articles, these are significant changes. So changes to your articles may need to be reported to the IRS on your next form 990 which is the annual filing that you file with the irs every year it's kind of like your tax return but you don't pay taxes so we don't call it a tax return um, if you change your articles those changes might be might be reported on your form 990 specifically both the full form 990 and the form 990 easy ask you to check a box if there's been a change to your nonprofit's name or a change to your nonprofit's address or any significant changes to your organizing or governing documents. So these are your articles, okay? And those include changes to your mission, changes to your board structure, uh, changes to your membership structure, including you know eliminating the membership or whatever, um, changes to your dissolution provision. Hopefully, people aren't changing that too much, and any provisions, you know, any other provisions amending the organizing documents. So you're gonna check yes the next time you file a 990 if you've amended your articles. Um, if it's just a change in name of address, you just write in the new name of address onto the form where you provide that information and check a box, that's enough. If it's any of those other more substantive changes, you attach a form called Schedule O and you explain to the IRS what, what your amendments were, okay? For people who file Form 990N, these are smaller organizations with with fewer than fifty thousand dollars, less than fifty thousand dollars in annual gross receipts, you do not get those boxes on the 990N to report changes to the IRS, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, however, 990N filers must report any name changes directly to the IRS as soon as your Articles of Amendment changing the name has been processed. Okay, because you don't have these kind of built-in mechanisms to, to report name changes. Um, you have to do an extra step and send a fax or a mailed letter to the IRS's customer account service department. You attach a copy of your articles of amendment and proof that they've been filed and received. Um, and then the IRS will change it will change your nonprofit's name in its system based on that filing. Okay. And it's it's really important that Form 990 and filers do this because if your legal name and your IRS name don't match up, it's, it can cause you huge problems in the future. Um, and affect your ability to 
maybe successfully file your 990 ads. Okay, so that's, a, that's, that's one of my top three things for folks to take away here about name changes. Let me just briefly go through bylaws. There is a separate webinar on bylaws. What I wanna talk about is how bylaws and articles interact with each other. So if articles are like your constitution, bylaws are more like statutes, they're more specific, they're more day-to-day, -day. whereas articles are sort of publicly retrievable, bylaws can be kept totally internal to your organization. You don't need to disclose them. I see bylaws sometimes on websites and stuff. People think that they have to put them out there. You don't, um, and, and I don't I don't really recommend it. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure why people do that. Um, articles are, sorry, by, this should say bylaws. Bylaws are easier to change because they're never filed with government agencies. When you update your bylaws, when you amend your bylaws, all you do is you get the board to vote on the change or you get your members to vote on the change. Then you just change it and then you file the new version away internally as your new bylaws that's it there's no articles of amendment nothing like that so because bylaws are more flexible um they're you know they're where you can put the more kind of granular details that could change over time bylaws are really important because they define how the organization makes decisions they establish your governance structure like if your organization has committees of the board, that's gonna be spelled out in your bylaws. They identify individual leadership responsibilities um, about directors, but also about officers. We haven't even talked about officers yet, right? Officers are like the chair of the board, your treasurer, your secretary, your CEO, um, all of these individual leaders of the organization, it's the bylaws that are gonna identify who those people are and kind of give you a job description for those people. Um, and, and bylaws are also legally enforceable. Um, they're kind of like a contract between the nonprofit and your directors and officers about how you're gonna operate. So bylaws are really important. Um, three ways that the bylaws interact with the articles. So we do recommend that some, some provisions just literally repeat what's in the articles. And the reason is that you should be giving your bylaws to all of your new directors, all of your new officers, key employees. So our template bylaws, are kind of like are redundant or they they repeat things like what is the nonprofit's name what is the nonprofit's person purpose do we have members what is our minimum number of directors and we even recommend that there's like a something similar to like the limitation on non-exempt activities clause that we mentioned basically we're not going to do illegal things or things that nonprofits can't do we do also recommend that that language be replicated in the bylaws just for completeness and clarity the really really critical thing here though is that if you're going to do that there needs to be consistency between your articles and your bylaws. The articles, because they're the more foundational document, because they're filed with the government, they will override whatever's in the bylaws, even if the bylaws say are more recent or say something different. Um, at the same time, because bylaws are easier to change, orgs will often make updates to their bylaws while ignoring parallel updates that need to be made in the articles. And over time, you get this divergence between what's in the bylaws and what's in the articles. And that can create a lot of confusion and uh, and disagreement and potential for legal non-compliance. So, you know, for example, I see people's mission purpose statements shift over time and they update it in their bylaws, but they don't go back to the um, articles and update those as well, okay? So another piece of homework for everyone is to not only pull your articles and see what's in them, um, but make sure that there is consistent language between your bylaws and your articles in areas where they overlap. Aside from total overlap, another important function of bylaws is that they expand upon concepts that are mentioned or you know, just kind of set up in the articles. So like board membership, right? Your articles will say, we have a board, there's gonna be at least three members. Your bylaws are then gonna go deep into detail about the maximum number of directors, who's qualified to serve, their term lengths, how they're elected, how they're removed. Okay, so that's a, that's like demonstrating how the bylaws provide a lot more detail. You know, we mentioned that the articles are gonna have a little paragraph about indemnification. Your bylaws are gonna have many more paragraphs about how you approve indemnification when you offer indemnification. Um, the bylaw, the articles say the board can amend stuff. Your bylaws are gonna go into more detail about how your board does amendments, um, what vote require is required to do amendments, et cetera. Okay, so these are not total overlaps, but they're, they're continuations on a theme. And then importantly, bylaws will cover critical governance and operational concerns that are typically not covered in the articles at all, like specific meeting and voting procedures, who your officers are, what your committees look like, and some specific administrative considerations like when your fiscal year starts, 
who's authorized to sign checks, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's why you need both documents. They're not interchangeable. They don't do the same thing. Um, your bylaws should be a lot more detailed. That's it. I, I blew through that bylaws part. <laughs> For folks who can still stay on a little bit longer, I'm going to turn to the questions box now and see if there's anything um, that we can continue to uh, elaborate on. But if folks want to contact me, it's jqu at dcbar.org. Send me a question. Um, check out our website um, for more information and services. Um, so let's see if we can knock off a few of these questions before we sign off today. Um, do, 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 do. Can the purpose be broader than the mission? Okay, we sort of touched on that. Uh, da, 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 what is it? Da, da, da. Okay, great. Well, actually, you know, not a lot of really detailed questions right now in the Q and A box. So since we're already over time, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop it now. Um, again, reach out if you have any questions and check those template articles and bylaws um, to help you get started on assessing what your organization has for itself. Thank you, everyone, for for staying over today um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, all.